Well, welcome everyone. I am so happy to see you all here. Um, as Gabriella just said, this is our final panel. And um, so just a, a brief overview of what we've been trying to achieve with these panels. We were seeking to build on Marcella Legrade's concept of sororidad, which is understood as a non-binary ethical, political and practical dimension of contemporary feminisms. In this track, we were considering sono sororidads as a critical frame to look at the sonic dimensions of patriarchy. As a feminist intervention in the archives of sound art, Sono Sororidades makes visible how sound and gender constructions intersect with each other and highlights the potential of the sonic to unveil and make audible unequal power dynamics where gendered violence and exclusion are perpetuated. So we've been inquiring in what it means to listen to Sono Sororidades, what that sounds like and explore together this political potential in creating non-exclusionary sounding futures and resounding past and present. To do so, we invited um, historical and theoretical papers, research creati creation projects that made visible the contribution of women and other LGBTQ artists in sound art and composition, technological intervention, media arts, radio and podcast productions, as well as other projects. So I'm really happy to have our three panelists here with us today. We have Luis Fernando William, am I saying this correctly? Apologies if not, who is a doctorate student in communication at the University Estudual Paulista, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, he has a master in communication and culture from the Universidad Federal de Rio de Janeiro and study cinema, communication, and career aesthetics. Uh, we also have Rustem Erteg Altine, who obtained his PhD in performance studies at New York University and is currently faculty at Kadir Has University, Istanbul, where he serves as the principal investigator of the research project, Staging National Abjection, Theater and Politics in Turkey and its Diasporas. And lastly, we have Lottie Sebus, who is an artist and researcher from Sydney with an artistic practice spanning the disciplines of sculpture, video, sound, installation, and performance art. She is currently living and working in Berlin and doing a Master of Arts in Sound Studies and Sonic Arts at the University of Kunst. So welcome everyone. We also have um, Gabriela Seves Sepulveda and Amanda Gutierrez in the room who are co-chairing the panel with me. And um, I, I am joining you from Vancouver from the Coast Salish nations of the Musqueam, um, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish nations. So first of all, I would like to invite Luis to present your paper. Great, can you hear me perfectly? Yes. Great. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Luis. I'm so glad to be here this afternoon or this morning in Canada, I think. Um, I'm a little bit nervous. I think it's always difficult to be the first one, <laughs> but okay, let's get started. I'm gonna share my screen now. Just one second. Um, can you see it? Yes. Great. So I'm going to present it. Okay, my paper is Musical Moments and Queer Heterotopias. Uh, this research is part of my dissertation which was written in the program of communication and culture in, of the university, <coughs> sorry, Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro. Uh, in this work, I analyzed musical films from a queer perspective by managing queer epistemologies and concepts to observe music and cinema. In this paper specifically, I bring Shafuko's concept of heterotopia to see in what ways it helps us to connect 
space, music, and queerness. So the first questions that mobilized this paper were musical moments when inserted in narrative films are able to move the plot to another dimension, as well as to promote new forms of engagement through spectatorship. Thus, we can think of music and songs as a disruptive force which emerges from the narrative and produces a realm of new possibilities. In the sense, how can we observe this disruption as a possible source of divine potentials? In what ways can these moments give way to other effects or queer effects? What are the possible relationships between sound, music, and divine sensibilities? How can these sensibilities be embodied through the moving images? Or how can musical moments construct a new space or a queer space? Many questions that demand another look at the qualities of music and moving image. Um, among an, an almost infinite range of aesthetic and narrative possibilities that cinema uses, we can say that music and more specifically song are elements that form an integral part of the cinema history. Music has effective powers insofar as songs have a body as their source of power, a body that sings, a body that through its gestures, its voice is capable of affecting other bodies. Therefore, when cinema uses song in narrative films, giving the bodies on screen the ability to sing, it can move the narrative to another place, a dimension that goes beyond the narrative itself. It can lead to other spaces and temporalities. What is intriguing here is the quality of music in emerging new affective, sensory, and aesthetic fields. So I look for these new possibilities that emerge from music from a queer perspective, uh, observing how they can conceive another space through image and sound. Thus, by bringing together all those questions, I propose here the main question to lead my work. To what extent musical moments operate as disruptive forces and how do they create a fertile ground for other possibilities of feeling, of experiencing spaces, fertile ground to build divine spaces? For this analysis, I rely on musical moments from the Brazilian film Tatuagem. I bring together theories that relate cinema and music, especially the concept of musical moment by Emmy Herzog and the concept of heterotopia by Michel Foucault. Uh, when I analyze the film, um, I look mainly for the performances of the body in the space, how it embodies music and sound, how, and how those performances go far beyond the narrative economy, how they can read the body to express a realm of feelings and sensations that may produce new spaces. Uh, Tatuagem is a Brazilian queer film released in 2013 by Yuton Lacerda. It's a queer film with musical moments within. Thus, I look for its musical moments to notice at first how they differ from the non-musical moments. In the sense, my hypothesis here is that the musical moments of this film are the most powerful and effective queer moments of it. I believe that the musical moments as moments of excess and attraction are moments when more easily, maybe, queer effects and sensibilities can arise. In these musical moments, I look for performances of otherness, performances that bring bodies with images that are stranger or disturbing from the perspective of the hegemonic and heteronormative culture. And it's interesting to see how those moments operate within the narrative. The film's narrative consists of a relationship between two men, two cisgender and white men. But in almost all the musical moments of the film, the scene is guided by strange or disturbing bodies, by queerer bodies maybe, uh, bodies that not necessarily are cisgender or white. 
besides the bodies that dominate the musical moments, bring with their performances queer effects and subjects in a more effective way. So that's the first tension or ambiguity we can notice between the musical moments and the non-musical moments of this film. But the analysis goes a little bit deeper when we approach the musical moments by themselves. Uh, first of all, uh, let me make clear what Ermi Herzog implies when she concepts the musical moment. Um, by analyzing the role of musical music and cinema, observing the relationship between sound and moving images, Herzog perceives how music is current, recurrently used as a support for the film subordinate element of the narrative, settled as an accessory to feed the emotions embodied on screen. In short, music, music has a secondary element within the, narr the narrative and the film. However, the author focuses exactly on the moments when there's a kind of inversion of this logic, moments when sound and music become dominant forces responsible for conducting the scene in terms of image and performance. From this inversion, a musical moment is produced. In her own words, as we can see here, in short, a musical moment, as I deploy the term here, occurs when music, typically a popular song, inverts the image sound hierarchy to occupy a dominant position in a filmic work. The movements of the image and hence the structuring of space and time are dictated by song. Herzog extensively analyzes the, how these musical moments are the core of another understanding and engagement with the film, how they propose something new and different for the narrative flow given up to the moment of its eruption. And as I say here, this something new and different created by tatouaging is a new space or a queer space or even a queer heterotopia circumscribed by music. I'm going to show you some frames from the movie. This one, from a musical moment. One. Look at the bodies and how queer they are. This one. Now I'm gonna show you the, the video, just a second. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. So let's get started. Deus, 
Este onipresente, onisciente, onipotente. I like so much to translate this song for you. <laughs> um, and I, this is just one example. Um, at the end of the song, uh, which names Polka do Cu, uh, the S Polka <laughs> in a literal translation. Uh, at the end of, of the song, the character claims an S utopia. He literally says, the only possible utopia is the S utopia. This musical moment, among the others in this film, is the most provocative one, not exactly because of how the bodies themselves are, but because of what they do, how they behave in the scene, uh, and especially what they are implying, what they are asking. Literally, a utopia where the S reigns. Uh, thus, I come to the point when the heterotopia informs the analysis. When Michel Foucault designs this concept in his essay of other spaces, he presents a term that is a little bit uh, vague or even confusing sometimes. Um, he didn't, he didn't uh, develop the concept in a profound way in this essay, but most importantly, is how the heterotopia is appropriated by authors and contemporary theories that discuss social spaces and especially theories about difference, uh, which are a good example of how the usage of the heterotopia is still increasing. Uh, so I ask how heterotopia can be read by queer lenses from a deviant perspective? Fortunately, the clue for the answer is within Foucault himself, when he talks about heterotopia and deviance. In his works, Foucault identified heterotopias of deviation as spaces marked by the presence of people who do not fit in the established social order. He gives as examples the prison, the mental hospital, the retirement home, as places occupied by individuals or social groups that are expect they are not expected to be part of the productive world, uh, the dominant society. In other words, subjects and bodies that are not expected to return to social norm. In Foucault's words, these are spaces in which individuals whose behavior is defined in relation to the average or norm are placed. Foucault speaks mostly about the In this sense, uh, may we claim a contemporary heterotopia where divine, divine groups and individuals can create, can perform, can sing and dance by themselves. Heterotopias where subjects and bodies appropriate aspects from the social norm and make parodies or pastiche. Heterotopias based on the existence of social norms, as Foucault implies, but also based on people's agency, based on deviant interests and desires. So I propose here, the film tatouaging, by promoting musical moments which give vent to a redistribution of bodies in the film, creates an aesthetic and narrative device to show certain bodies and performances where queer 
bodies and performances that somehow are stranger or more provocative to the social norm. Thus, the musical moments produce a more fertile ground to approach the queer subject, the divine body. And in the sense, provoke new sensibilities within, within the film, queer sensibilities specifically, sensibilities that may give a glimpse of, uh, of a heterotopia. Heterotopia circumscribed by music. So I think that's all. Thank you all for listening to me. I reiterate how glad I am to be here on screen <laughs> presenting a paper about heterotopia when there's almost a dystopia outside in Brazil and it's politics and <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Luis. That was awesome. I have some questions for you, but we'll move through uh, maybe the other two presenters and then we can all have a discussion at the end. That was great. Well done. All right. I can't see anyone. Is that supposed to be that way? I can't remember how Zoom works, but can you hear me? It looks good for us and your okay, presentation great. looks great. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. And I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to share my research with you today. My presentation is part of a larger project on contemporary critical engagements with the Kemalist ideology of secular modernization and Turkish nationalism. The project explores how feminist and queer subjects use aesthetic practices to invest in and transform Kemalism during a time of crisis and how their works challenge the political hegemony in Turkey. Today, I will discuss these themes by focusing on the digital performances of the duo Şelale Akırmak, Öyküm Taner, and MC Bebelak, Oğuzhan Okumuş, and their use of sound. But first, I'd like to explain what I mean by Kemalism and its current crisis. The formative years of the Republic of Turkey between 1923 and 38, also known as the Kemalist period after the president Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, were characterized by a centralized secular modernization, Europeanization, and nation building program. In this period, the politics of belonging were defined by what Lauren Berland terms infantile citizenship a form of citizenship founded on docile naivete and an uncritical embrace of the state's policies as a way of identifying with the nation. In Kemalism, infantile citizenship operated in entanglement with the fantasy of the nation as family. And in fact, the last name Ataturk uh, means the father of Turks. In the Kemalist psychoanalytical scenario, the father Ataturk is the sole progenitor and the ultimate object of sexual and political desire. Following Atatürk's death, Kemalism has been reformulated and redeployed by different groups in the service of competing political projects. With the rise of political Islam in the 1990s, the subjectivities of Kemalist individuals came to be marked by nostalgia for Turkey's formative years, which the anthropologist Esra Özgürek terms nostalgia for the mother. In this period, as the melancholic attachment to Atatürk escalated, his iconography began to take over bodies, especially in the form of tattoos and domestic spaces. This structure of feeling also influenced arts and entertainment, inspiring a variety of performances about the Kemalist period, including films, plays, and even pop music covers of amphibes. Since 2002, under the successive governments of the economically neoliberal, socially conservative, and Sunni Islamist Justice and Development Party, AKP, as Kemalism has been gradually marginalized, the melancholia and the experience of crisis that defines Kemalist subjectivity has intensified. While the AKP leaders initially presented themselves as pro-LGBT, as part of their bargain with liberal circles in Turkey and the European Union around 2002. This was soon replaced by intensified political oppression. Over the subsequent years, the AKP governments have propagated pathologizing discourses, attempted to close down LGBT organizations, banned pride parades, and refused to provide legal pro protection against hate crimes. 
Queer visibility in mainstream media has plummeted and many LGBT oriented websites and applications have also been banned. In this context, queer subjects experience citizenship in ways that are marked by failure and precarity. These processes have also inspired critical queer engagements with Kemalism, especially in the realm of digital performances, where individuals challenge the political hegemony while also both investing in and transforming Kemalist ideology through disidentificatory strategies. Jose Esteban Munoz uses the term disidentification to describe the survival strategies employed by minoritarian cultural producers and spectators in order to negotiate a public majoritarian public sphere. In this identificatory practices, minoritarian subjects attempt to negotiate the politics of belonging by neither aligning themselves with nor against the mainstream culture. Instead, they transform mainstream cultural products for their own cultural purposes. In their disidentificator performances, queer Kemalist subjects utilize national archives as well as popular culture products to resist and confound socially prescriptive, prescriptive patterns of identification. Among the performers who engage with Kemalist ideology in such critical and creative ways, the works of Shelali Akırmak and MC Bebelat are particularly interesting. Based in Istanbul at the time, the young duo is known for their YouTube videos where they transform Kemalist and popular culture archives with the aid of complex sound strategies in order to present a subtle queer political critique. Today, I will only talk about one of their videos, Atatürk's Republic Day speech, explaining it as if to someone from Harvard. In this video, MC Bebelak recites the English translation of a key text. Atatürk's speech for the 10th anniversary of the Republic in 1933. In this speech, Atatürk celebrates the achievements of the young nation states and urges citizens to continue working for the country. The title of the video is a reference to the present Recep Tayyip Erdogan's son, Bilal, who is a graduate of Harvard University. Since the release of his private phone conversations with his father in 2013, where they allegedly discussed their money laundering plans, the government's critics have accused Bilal Erdogan of possessing rather slow reasoning skills. In that sense, the aim of the translation and dubbing is not so much to reach a non turkey speaking audience as it is to criticize the corrupt government. In fact, the title of the video, as well as Şelali Akırmak's introductory and closing comments are in Turkish. In her introduction, Akırmak says, in case you can't understand it in Turkish, or if you have already forgotten it, this time let us recite it in English. While reproducing the discourse of not forgetting the nation's father, which has a central role in Kemalist memory politics, this comment frames translation and dubbing as a tool for political critique. During the opening speech, the video features the logo of the fictional production company, Anarcho Kemalist Productions. Anarcho Kemalism, as described by MC Bebelab, who identifies as a queer anarcho Kemalist, is a reformulation of Kemalism as an ideology characterized by sympathy for Atatürk, autonomism, and anti statism. In this rather radical reformulation, the Kemalist principle of statism has been abandoned for anarchism, while other principles, such as populism and nationalism, have been excluded for being peasantish or outdated. What is left behind is secularism and reformism, represented by two rather phallic looking arrows on the anarchy logo. Combined with the rainbow colors, the arrows suggest a queer investment in Kemalism, one that aspires to create fundamental change by challenging the hegemonic norms of gender and sexuality. Türkçesini bugüne kadar anlayamadıysanız ya da çoktan unuttuysanız bir de İngilizce anlatalım. During the introductory comments, the Izmir anthem plays in the background. This highly sentimental anthem, which is in contrast with Akırmak's relatively neutral voice, mourns for the losses in the wars leading to the inception of the Republic and praises Atatürk's military prowess. 
commonly played or sung in the public celebrations on national holidays. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, the music can remind audiences uh, of the spectacles they attended or performed in when they were children. At these spectacles, as children sing anthems, read poetry, and dance to declare their love and loyalty to the nation's dead yet immortal father, the adults believe in the utopian potential of Kemalism and their hopes for Turkey's future are reinvigorated. At a time when AKP tends to cancel or ban most public celebrations on national holidays, the anthem not only invokes the pain associated with Atatürk's death, but also reminds the audiences of what many Kemalists perceive as the AKP government's destruction of his heritage. As it sets the effective tone for the performance to follow, the Ismerian theme thus frames this performance as a venue for a remotely shared experience of Kemalist melancholia, a digital alternative to the live performance. Moreover, the end theme foreshadows how the artists will attempt to transform existing archives and repertoires in the service of queer anarcho Kemalism. Today is the greatest day for our republic is 10 years old. Happy Republic Day. At this moment, as a part of great Turkish nation, I am in the deepest joy and excitement of reaching this blessed day. My fellow citizens, in a short time, we have done many and great deeds. The greatest one, the foundation of these deeds, is the Turkish valor and high Turkish culture, Turkish Republic. In the main performance, based on archival footage from 1933, we see Atatürk delivering the speech. Over this footage, MC Bebelakal recites the text in English. The rising intonations and the passionate delivery place the performance in a genealogy of nationalist performances. The background music also supports the effectively intense delivery of the text. This time, the music is not a Turkish anthem, however, but the famous soundtrack of the video game Age of Empires II. This historical real-time strategy game is set in the Middle Ages, and players command a civilization shaping history. As such, beyond its effective impact, the music also suggests a desire to change the historical course of events that have led to the contemporary crisis. For audiences who played the game, the music may also invoke the feelings of power, responsibility, and urgency associated with the video game experience. Thus, it invites audiences to take action in order to reinvigorate the Kemalist nation state utopia, albeit in a radically revised version of it. The performance's incorporation of patriotism is also marked by queer access, which is strongly present in the frequent and audible exhales, the intonations, and the desires in MC Bebelak's voice, especially when he says, the Turkish Republic. The recaption demonstrates how active listening and auditory literacy are developed through participation in sound economies and how ways of listening can structure perception and create an ethos of community. Queer listening is one such way. When I asked my colleagues about their effective impressions of the performance, those who identify as on the queer spectrum or are familiar with Turkish queer cultures were more likely to share my oral perception of queer desire in the performance. In that sense, the, this effective component of the performance, which I perceive as an integral part of its politics, is more likely to be audible to certain audiences. It is worth noting, however, that queer subjectivities are formed and experienced intersectionally. As such, rather than a single queer, Turkish queer community with clearly demarcated borders, it would be more helpful to think about multiple and intersecting communities, recognized, sustained, and transformed with the aid of similar, connected, yet not necessarily identical ways of listening. In the non-maternal national family scenario that defines Kemalist citizenship, the father is an object of both identification and desire. In this performance, where MC Bebelak's voice subsumes Atatürk's voice and takes over his body, a queer union occurs between the citizen and the nation's father. 
As MC Babelak's re-embodied voice interpolates audiences as Kemalist subjects, in a subtly erotic way, sexual and political desires converge. Thus, while rendering the incestus and other queer allegories that undergird Kemalism audible, the performance suggests and even promotes a queer claim for the nation and its history, challenging both the hegemonic social political dynamics in Turkey and the dominant interpretations of Kemalism. The entanglement of erotic desire with melancholy and patriotic passion in this performance is not unique. Not only the broader fetishization of Ataturk since the late 1990s, but also specific everyday and artistic performances uh, and practices of Kemalist melancholia, including video and digital arts, photography, and most spectacularly Ataturk themed BDSM practices, reflect such eroticized and melancholic attachment to the nation's late father. Beyond the specific experience of Kemalist subjects, the erotic impulse is actually an integral part of melancholia. Developed as a response to Freud's pathologizing account, Georgia Agamben's conceptualization of melancholia defines this structure of feeling as a mode of becoming. For Agamben, melancholia is not so much the regressive reaction to the loss of the love object, as it is the imaginative capacity to make an unobtainable object appear as a lost. He argues, and I quote, if the libido behaves as if a loss has occurred, although nothing has in fact been lost, this is because the libido stages a simulation where what cannot be lost, because it has never been possessed, appears as lost. And what could never be possessed, because it had per perhaps never existed, may be appropriated in so far as it is lost. Melancholia and the erotic impulse it involves thus make the subjects distance themselves from the ordinary and focus on the potentialities and possibilities of the imagination, which are grounded in culture. Melancholia's compulsion to transform an object of contemplation into what Agamben terms an amorous embrace can thus allow the subject discover new political possibilities. Similarly, Jose Munoz argues that melancholia can function as a mechanism that helps us reconstruct identity and carry our dead into the various battles we must wage in their names and in our own. In battle, however, not only we, but also our dead and the histories they bring with them are transformed. In queer Kemalist melancholia, Ataturk is an object of attachment that is neither appropriated nor lost, but possessed and lost at the same time. The attachment to the nation's late father thus inspires the subjects to indulge in fantasy, envision and propose new political possibilities through decided future strategies. anarcho kemalism has little, if anything, to do with the dominant formulations of Kemalism, nor does it reflect a desire to invest in political hegemony in the present, characterized by the AKP's amalgamation of economic neoliberalism, social conservatism, and Sunni Islamism. With such performances, the artists propose strategies to reimagine the past, explore other ways of being in the world, and develop alternative imaginations for the future. In the case of Shelali Akırmak and MC Bebelak, sound plays a central role in these processes by mobilizing memory and affect, reconfiguring embodiment, and producing desire. Following the black and white archival footage of joyful young people celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Republic, the video ends with Shelali Akırmak's closing comments, accompanied by the anarcho-Kemalism logo. The background music is again the sentimental Izmir theme. She says, you still can't understand it? Then ask a Harvard graduate for help. We hope they have understood. However, we already know that there's no such hope. If Turkey's new political elite has any interest in some version of Kemalism, it is not Şelali Akırmak and MC Bebelak's queer anarchist reformulation, but rather one that reproduces the authoritarianism of the Kemalist single party period and emphasizes Turkish ethnic nationalism, which is also very much part of the Kemalist heritage. The immediate content of the performance, the performer's broader body of work and their comments on the social media websites through which their works are distributed also suggests that they don't really have much hope in terms of tra transforming the governing elite. In that sense, this closing comment does not actually reflect a politics of hope. 
It rather renders the failure that characterizes the performance, as well as queer Kemalist subjectivity in contemporary Turkey, visible and audible. As such, it is actually an embrace of failure. As Jose Munoz argues, queerness's failure is temporal. This failure is called potential utopian, and in as much as it does not adhere to straight time, interrupting its protocols, it can be an avant-garde practice that interrupts the here and now, end of quote. With such performances where they reimagine the past and propose alternative futures with the aid of sonic strategies and digital technologies, queer Kemalist subjects resist and challenge political hegemonies in the present. In this resistance, according to Jake Halberstam, is among the most valuable things that failure can provide. The ability to escape the punishing norms that discipline behavior and manage human development. Thus, the artists sustain an intersectionally troubled existence in an oppressive sociopolitical environment. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was so interesting. I have some questions for you, but maybe we'll move on to Lottie and then we'll all have a chat together. That was great. Thank you, Atuk. Thank you so, so much. Um, okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen if I can. One second, sorry. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah. Great. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm Lottie Sebes um, and thank you so much to Louise and the STEM for your talks and also to Freya for your introduction. Um, although, uh, um, yeah, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to, to discussing some, some more after, after our talks and, uh, and finding some bridges between our different research and practice. Um, and like Louise and Rustem, I, I plan to unpack some queer uh, sonic and artistic methodologies for rec the reclaiming political space and narratives in my talk. Uh, but in my case, I will be uh, speaking about my own artistic strategies and methodologies and practice as they relate to my research. So my artistic practice spans the fields of video performance and installation, and I'm driven by my own fascination with uh, the past lives, cultural meanings and living agencies of old and new technologies. Uh, and today I would like to discuss a performance based artistic research project in which I investigated technologies which were predominantly used by women in the 19th and early 20th centuries. This group includes the sewing machine, domestic piano and typewriter, as well as vocal simulators and synthesizers from the late 1930s. These machines tell stories of entangled cultural and technological development over time. As Hillel Schwartz articulates, our bodies themselves have been configured into machinehood. So in sharing this research with you, I'd like to show, as Haraway also espouses, that technologies can be understood as crystallizations of the gendered social interactions surrounding them. In my sonic performative reappropriation of these technologies, I've re-instrumentalized them using and manipulating their sounds to re-signify their social and cultural meanings. So in this presentation, I'm going to discuss two interdependent fronts of my research, which have really informed and fed into each other throughout my project. And firstly, I'd like to discuss my historical research into the gendered histories of these machines. And secondly, I will speak about my studio-based practice in which I reappropriated aspects of these technologies for use in a sonic performance context. So let's jump straight into talking about the historical aspect of my research. I've identified design continuities between different machines which were predominantly used by women in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And these continuities may have arisen because machines which were marketed at women uh, were designed similarly to machines already commonly used by women. Uh, so in the following slides, I'm going to summarize some of these gendered aspects of this historical technological design. 
So in the 19th century, piano manufacturers pandered to a domestic female market by producing smaller pianos, which matched domestic interiors of the day and could double as furniture. So at this time, while professional musicianship remained an overwhelmingly male field, playing the piano in a domestic context was commonly considered a graceful accomplishment and a good way for middle-class women in Britain and the United States to attract a husband. So in this way, women's relationship with the piano in this context was closely tied to the functioning of patriarchal power relations. And simultaneously, sewing machine manufacturers wanted to distance themselves from the aesthetics of the factory with designs that easily assimilated into a domestic setting. And hence, sewing machines and pianos became habitually thought of together as different kinds of domestic appliances and were often sold in the same stores. The early design history of the typewriter also indicates that its association with the feminine was constructed from the outset in order to position the typewriter as, as the woman's tool and thereby to secure cheap labor. And this was done through appropriation of features from the piano and the sewing machine. So you can see this in the piano like black and white keys of the patent model of the first typewriter, the Scholes, Gidden and Sewell machine from the 1860s on the left as well as the cast iron stand of the first commercial model on the right. And the commercial model also features a foot pedal like the sewing machine and the piano. This was used to trigger the carriage return. Public opinion surrounding women's use of machines in the 19th century was quite rife with contradiction. Uh, sewing machines, for example, were hailed by some as a liberator from domestic drudgery because they involved skills which were possibly transferable to work in other industrial contexts. However, this was met with some strong opposition at the time, some of which was connected to moral panic around women's sexuality and also veiled behind concerns for their health and safety. So one particularly extreme example I'd like to share with you involves a Parisian doctor named Eugène Goubault, who claimed in 1866 that the bipedal industrial sewing machines at the time, so they had two pedals, caused the operator's thighs to rub together in such a way that the motion produced an involuntary masturbatory effect. So he argued that symptoms such as weakness, fatigue, weight loss and vaginal discharge indicated that this machine was detrimental to women's health. The single pedal sewing machine that we have as a result of this debate today demonstrates that the sewing machine has had gendered relations designed in due to patriarchal power structures. The phenomenon of certain devices being operated by women because of their similarities to previous machines of feminized labor continued into the 20th century. Uh, vocal simulators and synthesizers from 1939, including the Voda, which you see here, and the Zona Box, which I'll speak about later, are examples of this trend. And as audio technologies, these two machines also demonstrate a sonic dimension of patriarchal power relations at the time. The Voda was the first electric vocal synthesizer, and because of the expert skill required to operate it, the opportunity was reserved for telephone switchboard operators, a traditionally female occupation, and these women would have had experience working with electronic circuits in their job and may have also had experience playing the piano and typing. And this experience would have been very relevant as the motions and coordination required to create the illusion of human speech with the voda was very similar to playing a parlor organ. In the same year in which the voda was first demonstrated, Gilbert H. Wright filed a patent for the Zonavox. And this is a mechanism which produced a recorded sound by two transducer speakers, as you can see here, which were held directly onto the throat of the operator. And the frequencies of the recording from a record vibrated the operator's vocal so non vocal sounds on record, such as a train whistle or a car horn, could thus be made to speak. That a device like the Zonavox was so commonly operated by women has differing explanations to the voter. Uh, Jacob Smith identifies that the Zonavox was used commercially in radio advertising to create jingles and in films to voice the inner thoughts and desires of female characters. And hence he argues actresses were hired to speak to what was presumed to be a majority female audience. Advertisements and demonstrations of the Zonavox from the 40s also evidence that a sex sells mentality drove a trend which saw catchy jingles uh, delivered from the bodies and mouths of sexually objectified Zonavox operators. Early devices 
uh, from vocal simulation provide other possible clues to this trend of women's prominence in early vocal simulation. So looking even further back now, many speaking automata from the 18th and 19th centuries involved white male inventors using bodies or effigies of women and people of colour, like ventriloquist dummies in the production of simulated vocal sound. So for example, Joseph Faber's early mechanical talking machine from 1845, known as Euphonia, was connected to a humanoid mask, which was dressed either as a woman or a racially stereotyped Turk to use his terminology. Uh, placing such masks onto non-human machines affirmed the otherness of women and people of color in relation to the white male inventor. And in the context of the machine's operation also placed them under his control. Thomas Edison's phonographic female dolls from 1890 provide another example of female gendered automatons being used to mechanically reproduce vocal sound. So each of these large and heavy dolls contained a miniature Edison wax phonograph of a nursery rhyme inside her tin chest. And Paul Flagg argues uh, that hidden female workers who re individually recorded these rhymes in factories were in fact reduced to ventriloquized dolls in this production process, offering another controllable version of the other to the male creator and inventor. The gendering of synthesized voices continues to be a pertinent topic in the 21st century as artificially intelligent assistants that we all know, such as Apple's Siri and Amazon's Alexa, integrate more and more into our lives. The corporations developing these tools reinforce social norms by gendering the bots artificially, using high pitched voices, traditionally female names, and even a flirtatious and deferential style. So here we see a historical parallel between contemporary service bots and women who worked as switchboard operators who were also expected to remain passive and deferential in their role. The fact that computer engineering teams are also staffed by majority men also reveals a kind of ventriloquism whereby male programmers control the way in which female gendered machines interact with human society. So based on these examples, we've seen how gender relations and stereotypes have become an inherent part of technological design and reciprocally how these designs have reinforced gendered divisions of machine use. So now I'd like to go on to the second part of my presentation in which I'll discuss my own studio based artistic practice. Uh, and here I investigated how some of these relations could be resampled to challenge and reclaim the legacy of these machines in a contemporary context. The studio-based component of my research involved selecting and playing with a range of technical artifacts from the historical research I've just outlined for use in a sonic performance context. So over many months in the studio, which was concurrent to my theoretical research, I developed an interconnected interface, which was comprised of components of these machines. So the interface ultimately included two sewing machines, a talk box, a series of foot pedals and archival sound recordings from advertisements and demonstrations of these devices. And my intention was to reassemble and reforge existing entanglements of gender and technical media in this performance. Um, I ultimately entitled it Verit Veritas Ventriloquist and you can watch a video of one version of this performance immediately after the session um, at 4 p.m. Brazilian time. So when using the sewing machines in the studio, I approached these devices as a sonic artist. I was untrained in machine sewing. So I therefore wanted to explore ways of using the machine and its pedal first and foremost as sonic instruments. Instead of using the machine to sew in my performance, I attached an electromagnetic microphone to its motor, which transposes the electromagnetic radiation it emits to an audible range. This microphone gives us access to aspects of the material world, like the flow of electricity, to which the machine is normally privy while we are not. Uh, hence, I think it allows us to really hear beyond the machine's functional use into other aspects of its materiality. This microphone is a very interesting tool for post-humanist exploration in that it conceivably allows the machine to speak to us in its own language, revealing a non-human material reality and the implicit knowledge of the machine. The foot pedal, which would normally be used to control the sewing machine, the sewing speed, sorry, is then uh, able to control the, the volume and the tone color of the noise that is amplified by the microphone. So to enhance and broaden the sonic possibilities of this interface, I've wired three sewing machine pedals from different machines in series. 
so I can control the flow of electricity on several front fronts. Uh, and two of the sewing machine pedals are controlled under my feet, and one is attached to an instrument harness on my chest. The torque box, which I'll also describe a bit more in a moment, leads into my mouth. So there are several kind of arteries or umbilical cords with lines which seem to connect my body, well, they do connect my body into the machine. And in this way, I make my body a functioning part of the apparatus. Historical machines, which I've discussed, such as the Zonovox, provide an ideal cursor to this kind of practice where the human body is sonically and physically integrated into the machine, acting as its sounding board. However, in a live context, the volume of my self-made Zonovox couldn't be heard over the acoustic sounds of the sewing machine. And for this reason, I decided to use a similar technology, a talk box, in place of the Zonovox. So this is an effects pedal designed for guitar. Uh, it's similar in functioning to the Zonavox in that it propels sound waves from a loudspeaker, which is contained in that little box, uh, through surgical tubing into the player's mouth, where the sound is filtered and picked up by a microphone. Using the talk box, the sound emanating from my mouth is not my voice at all, but rather the sound of the machine filtered by the changing shape of my vocal cavity to create different tone colours and spectral effects. So in this process, I integrate my vocalic body into that of the machine. Uh, and I aim to weaponize its destructive sound for the sisterhood who have traditionally operated these machines. Nina Sudeetheim argues that in uh, adding apparatuses or impediments uh, to the voice, uh, this, this kind of practice can be imagined as a way to remark on, negotiate and play with the boundaries between nature and culture. And the talk box performs a similar role in my performance as a tool which challenges expectations of the kind of voice which might emerge from my body. It thereby confronts normative gender binaries as well as the con contradictory associations of monstrousness and purity which have been projected onto women's bodies more generally. I also integrate archival material into my performance using both the talk box and a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine. My intervention into these recordings involves manual slowing of the tape, uh, which you can see here on, in the image of the, on, the, on the left with the foot of the, of the sewing machine. And this audio is sent to a delay, digital delay pedal as well, which allows me to intervene with the temporality of the playback on several fronts. And through my intervention, words repeat themselves and syllables stretch into these incomprehensible drones. And under this kind of subversive control, this voice of authority begins to lose efficacy and command over the transmission of truth. And uh, so these, these, these voices on the, on the tape become abstract sonic material with which I can play. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, later in the performance, I speak a text compiled of fragments of these sources, mouthing words with the talk box, which allow the machine to speak to the audience through me. Freya Jarman Ivans contests that the queer potential of the voice is at its strongest when technologies, including the internal physiological technologies of the body, external human-made audio technologies, as well as Foucauldian technologies of power become audible. So she argues that both the voice and the cyborg occupy a space on the boundary between nature and culture, between the bodily and the semiotic, which make them powerful tools for the disruption and confusion of binary gendered divisions. In my performance practice, I strive to make each of these layers of technology heard in order to birth the queer figure of the cyborg and to upset binary gendered assumptions surrounding the sewing machine. Here, borrowing from Ivan's definition, which draws from the etymology of the word queer, queering can be seen as a process or a practice of questioning and inquiry, which is involved in the act of unsettling, making strange or dramatizing the existing incoherencies in our assumed links between gender, power, bodies, and sexuality. Judith Butler's uh, theorization of gender as a stylization of the body is also negotiated throughout the performance. So at times I lean into feminized tropes of behavior, traditional postures, dress codes, and roles. However, I also aim to disrupt this message to introduce glitch and noise to this signal. The body performs a kind of natural glitch as bodily imperfections choking on the tube and, and aggression seep through the cracks. As Andrew Brooks writes, 
queer theory glitches the understanding of identity as a stable and fixed category by introducing noisy concepts into normative systems. So in my performance, I aim to articulate deviant and glitched identities by switching between different modes and relations and choreographies, which we might recognize from the everyday performance of gender in our lives. This disruption can also be read in the sonic noisiness of the performance. To quote Brooks again, interference and disturbance, figured here as noise, can rupture the fabric of normativity, revealing hegemonic power structures as ontologically unstable and chaotic. So in resampling the archive of media history in this disrupted, imperfect and noisy way, my intention with this project has been to take a performative historiographical stance to queer historical research methodologies and to look at this study not as a process of unearthing truths, but rather as a way of making a claim to gendered cultural associations in the archive of media history. So before I finish, I'd like to quickly draw attention to some further and more diversified research on this topic. A key missing aspect or perspective in this project has been the relationship between technologies and gender in a non-Western context, particularly in relation to the sewing machine. By the beginning of the 20th century, European and North American sewing machine manufacturers were targeting non-Western markets, where this machine began to interact with various local cultural and social dynamics. And in this context, the machine became entangled in colonial and missionary power relationships as it was used to promote European ideals of modernity and patriarchal concepts of moral women's roles. What's more, since the 1970s, the new international division of labor has made exploitative sweatshop labor in the global south a well-known and very problematic phenomenon, providing for the fast fashion industries of higher income countries and portions of society. I felt conflicted in trying to incorporate these themes into my research and performance, in part because uh, as a privileged and Western woman, I hesitate to tell stories which arguably don't belong to me. However, certainly this is an aspect of the sewing machine social construction, which is a very strong relevance. And I've left some examples of research in this broad area here on my final slide. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to discussing further and hearing more about the, uh, the other research projects during question time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lottie. That was so interesting. That was awesome. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so maybe we can open this up into a conversation um, between all of us. And um, there were many similarities there. And I just wanted to, to um, pull on a phrase that uh, Turk mentioned, which was reimagining the past to propose alternate futures. And I think they all had an element of this in them. And I think it would be really interesting to explore that um, reimagining in relation to sono soro redares and how that concept might um, enable us to formulate these futures and if so what would they what, what would it sound like what would it look like so that's kind of a comment question that I would like to pose to everyone and please um, everyone else that is in the room please feel free to jump in here with any thoughts ideas comments I'll just say a couple of brief words to maybe I'll just say start, a brief start words. Uh, uh, I, maybe this is why the archival turn has is still relevant for uh, both gender and sexuality research and sound research and their intersections. I do not think it has been, I mean, to my knowledge or in my experience, it has received the attention it deserves in the intersection of these fields. And that's why I have been uh, so impressed by the presentations of my uh, fellow, fellow speakers. So there is so much potential in both of these projects in terms of further exploring the continuing relevance of the archival turn and how it is also about heterotopias, also about uh, utopianism, and also about very much about the contemporary politics of production of gendered labor. So I, 
I'd just like to say I love the presentations and maybe the archival turn is still relevant for exploring these dynamics. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Atok. That's really interesting. I also found the the uh, the archival relationship between our, our two our two research projects to be of really strong relevance and really exciting. Um, I guess you know in this in this moment where like this this kind of increasingly digital moment where all of this material is so or a lot of it is so accessible, you know, and this stuff is on YouTube everywhere. I mean, so many more people have access to to intervening in these sorts of spaces and, and trying to reclaim the kinds of ideologies that are that are embedded in them. And I think this is a this is an exciting moment in that um, we can start to reclaim some of this power from institutions to decide what these narratives are and what they mean to us and who has who has power to to kind of write and rewrite these stories. Um, so yeah, like you said, that's a that's a really exciting moment, I think. Okay. Um, thanks for everyone. Your presentations were very, very, very good. <laughs> uh, and intriguing and provocative. I'm thinking about uh, how, is, how it's interesting to think about past and future in the present. And I'm so curious about how to approach utopia nowadays uh, in post-modernity or post-humanity. It's a concept so difficult to approach. Uh, heterotopia may be a way, but I'm not sure. It's a question for everyone, even for myself. I, I love this concept of, of queer failure that uh, that Ertuk brought up from Haberstram. Um, I, I feel like this is a very freeing idea um, to kind of work through, uh, especially I think when when we think about utopia, we very often think about progress and and moving forward. And this is a concept which is so easily um, co-opted by capitalism uh, that sometimes pulling away from this idea of a brighter future where everything is better um, and, and going into queer failure, embracing failure, embracing uh, different ways of doing things, broken systems, noise, as I said, can be um, a quite freeing and revolutionary way to to um, to imagine something that's really that's that's truly different, right? I think in terms of thinking about utopia and utopianism, one problem I sense is the immediate association of utopianism and especially queer and other minoritarian utopianism with liberal or progressive ends. So in some of my other work, actually, I work on a Turkish eugenicist and fascist, like kind of openly fascist uh, playwright, politician and librettist. And how he just imagined the eugenicist future for the nation state in a very much utopian way and how he attempted to produce performance or at least dramatic texts as an investment to that kind of utopian future. So maybe when thinking about the temporal politics of utopianism, we should also um, distance ourselves from the immediate association with liberal or progressive ends and also acknowledge how messy queer utopianism can get in ways that's not immediately desirable at least. Yes, uh, thank you for, for your wonderful presentations. I'm so inspired by, by all your works and I, I feel re reignited by Ertug's um, kind of push for the archival turn. Um, I, I myself have been working on it for a while and, and sometimes I'm like, ah, but then I saw, you know, seeing your work, Loti, uh, it's so, so amazing and uh, um, really, really interesting. Um, so I, I wanted to do kind of some questions to, to, to each of you. I think it, it might have relate with our problems with Utopia. Because um, I, I think that there was a, te a tension between Luz and Artuk uh, in the way that Luz uses heterotopia and queer failure in Artuk's, which, which, and, or, or disidentification from Jose Esteban Munoz. Um, 
Um, so I was wondering, Luis, in your presentation, um, you, you, you explained musical moments as, as this like space that kind of, you know, as you could see like a space of critique or a space of failure, or a space that constructs heterotopia. But, I, but and, and not knowing enough of the film, um, and, and I, I tried to find a translation for the song, which was really evocative, uh, and I posted there, sorry. Um, I wonder how this musical moment works in an already queer film. And whether and this might be a, something that I don't understand because of the context, but if the if the film is already queer, and is still like how do you how do you manage that contradiction or that tension between what the film's already doing and then what the musical moment's doing with that song? Just a more detailed question for you. Just taking notes here, just a second. <laughs> Uh, it's a very good question, and it was one of my questions in my dissertation. Um, yes, there's ambiguity and there's contradiction between the musical moments and the non-musical moments, even in queer movies. Uh, what I'm implying with this paper and in my dissertation is that most queer movies that use musical moments within uh, they kind of redistribute bodies in the film. For example, Tatuaji, uh, there are two characters who are white and cisgender, and they are the most characters. In, so in the musical moments in this film, they are not uh, controlling the scene, the images. There, there are other bodies doing it. And the bodies that are doing it are queer bodies. Our bodies are more, they are stranger, they are more provocative, and not the bodies themselves, but they, what they are saying, what they are singing are more provocative. And it's funny to think why is music and song used to provoke, to create this moment, to create these uh, questions, to, you see? So the, the funniest thing about this movie is because they, they are queer, they are queer movies, but they're, they're, they're, they're queerer moments are the musical moments. That's my point. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I guess that was a curiosity I had. And I think it has to do with something that I wanted to ask Ertuk when you, when you started to, to say of how you listen, how, how the artists were uh, reproducing the speech of, um, I'm going to say it wrong, the Kamalist leader. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then you, you said that you listened as a queer, uh, that you identify the listening as a queer form of listening in the way that it sounded. But then you started thinking about how other, others might not listening, listen at it at, as, a, as a queer speech, right? So I was interested in, in, in thinking about, and you did talk about intersectionality and not being, you know, like we're not, there's no one form of queer listening, but I also thought that that was a very interesting concept also in relationship to, to queer failure in the way about um, queer listening and how our voices carry some form of gendered, uh, racial, ethnic uh, tonality already that could be um, subversive, right? Or that can, can disrupt can be you know a form of disrupting the the normative forms of sounding and listening um it's just it's a comment that I, that i thought it was kind of like a little thank you so much and it's also about i think the audibility of desire how is sonic expressions articulations and performances of desire audible to certain subjects and can pass by others. So that's also part of, I think, the sonic politics of sexuality. And in addition to uh, failure, it's also very much about uh, what Karen Thompson calls uh, remote intimacies. So how uh, communities of uh, remoteness, if you like, uh, are formed through ways of listening and ways of hearing certain forms of affect and through bodies being affected by these sounds in specific ways, 
even though those bodies may never be in the same space physically. So this is also one thing that uh, so some technologies can provide us. Thank you. I love that, Ertug, and then that takes me back again to what Lewis was saying earlier about um, the disruptive force of sound and the potentiality for disruption there. I really like, really like the link between those things. Um, and in terms of sono soro redadis, if we were thinking about that in terms of a disruptive force, um, how do you think we could articulate that in each of your projects in just a one one line sentence? Well, it's a <laughs> one line. It's a little bit difficult. Uh, uh, I think, uh, especially in my paper. Um, we think about sono sordidades, I like this term. <laughs> uh, we can think about music and song, the potentiality to sing uh, as a sharing, uh, as a way to, to share sensibilities, experiences, and thus create a new space, a new form of living, maybe. This is a kind of sodo sordidade, I think. <laughs> I would say the reiteration and re-performance of even the mundane and the majoritarian can provide performances and articulations of resistance, as well as the reproduction of power dynamics in all kinds of contexts that are in and through which sono sonoridades can also, uh, I'm sorry, sono sonoridades can also be expected to exist and to be formed and perhaps also to unfold. Thank you so much. Yeah, for me, this is a particularly interesting concept to think through when, uh, when addressing specifically my research into the vocal simulation technologies that were used by, by women in the past because I feel this strong uh, resonance and uh, and a kind of sisterhood with with these women when I'm kind of uh, it's a kind of, it's kind of reenactment that I feel I'm I'm doing in their in their honor in a way um, and so especially as this is a this is a concept uh, a kind of a feminist concept that's that's kind of been been around for a while it, it feels like a a concept which can connect generations of feminists um, generations of women doing um, like working. In, on the borderlines of, of sonorities, I mean, uh, these women were, were sonic pioneers in terms of the kinds of technologies that they were using. Um, I feel very connected to a, to a kind of cross-temporal sister, uh, sisterhood when I'm, when I'm performing this work. Just one comment. Uh, it's very nice that the term sono uh, was kept in Portuguese. <laughs> it's it's. Oh, I love this. So we have new forms of living, articulation of resistance and um, uh, response to power dynamics and the cross temporalities of sisterhood. <laughs> this is a really beautiful combination there. <laughs> um, I have a question in, in more than um... More than a question, it's also a comment that it, it really looking at watching us at your at your presentations, it reminds me of, and especially Edward and Louis, and is the film Paris is Burning? Because you you are departing from from a very cinematic approach, and cinema itself is this um, a, this modern or, or, or this technology that we are approaching in order to understand this utopias, and um, in the utopias that is they are in this space where reenactment, right, reenactment on, on gender, political reenactment, and most importantly, a space of um, a common ground where music and in in performing gender, it's one of the of the main. Um, kind of like a 
framework. And I remember when I watched Parties is Burning, a 90, 90 uh, documentary actually from Jenny Livingstone. I was um, very, very struck by this um, a space of um, a utopian a situation, a utopian space where, where this, this happened. But I wonder about, and I wonder when I was watching this film, the approach in the relationship of the filmmaker with the subjects, right? In this case, it's a documentary film. Um, I think it's it's closer to Cinema de Barite, so you never seen her in there. And in the case of the films that you show, I wonder what do you think is the relationship of the filmmaker with the subject, if she considers or them considers or him considers themselves as one uh, as a queer um, being, as a queer individual, and how that helped to uh, create and construct this um, this universes, right? This is spaces in, in cinema. That's a very good question. Uh, I'm still thinking about the, about the similarities between Paris is Burning and Tatuaging. They are kind of similar in some points, but uh, Yuton Lacerda, uh, he's a director of Tatuaging. He's a, he's a queer guy. And most importantly, he he's from Recife, the north of Brazil. And this is a region in Brazil, uh, so specific, it's so specific. Uh, its culture is a little bit, bit different from the south. And sometimes uh, when people from north come to south, uh, they are kind of, there's, uh, there, there, there's tension between people here, especially because of the kosher. And I don't know if you know, but uh, the south of Brazil like uh, leads the Brazilian's appearance abroad. So it's very interesting to think how he creates this space, this heterotopias or queer heterotopias in the north of the country. So I think he implies himself in this things, I think. Oh, uh, thanks. That was a wonderful question. I, I, I think then there might be, I'm reading, I wanted to ask something to Loti, but it just makes me think about um, um, there might be some issues with race and ethnicity that come to play um, between the North and the South of Brazil, right? That might also uh, speak about this need to make a queer theratopia through a movie. I don't know, I'm just guessing. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, it was crashing a little bit here. I couldn't oh, understand. Perfectly. I was just saying that, um, and I don't know uh, if you could speak about the North and South, which is, uh, it's also a racial and ethnic division between Brazil, yeah. right? Which might yeah. be important, yeah. And there's lots of prejudice here with the people from North. Uh, yeah, I, I thought that was interesting too. So Loti, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinating fascinated by your work um, and, and the way that you're using reenactment or reperformance or remediation or reactivation to think about a historical archive and the gendering of technology is something that I'm, I'm really passionate about and interested in. And I wanted to ask, uh, one is like, how do, how do you, how is the process of remediation? Like you, you talked about it in, in terms of honoring and sisterhood, uh, right now uh, to Freya, but I was wanting to hear to hear mo more about the effective, like the embodied, um, what you feel when you're, when you're, you know, re-performing, what's your relationship um, with, with, with uh, the non-humans in your, <laughs> in your performance. And also, uh, I really appreciate that uh, in our previous panels, um, we were, and, and, and this goes for everyone too, we were talking about how uh, this new form, um, listening as a form of care or care as an ethical barometer for what can sono sororidades sound like. Um, and one of the things that you're bringing in is the non-human uh, uh, as an integral part of it, um, which is also present a little bit in Ertug as these things are um, 
circulated digitally, I think, the, the, the video. So I don't know if we can talk about the non-human and the embodied aspects in, in OT. Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, that's uh, they're very very interesting. Um, yeah, I think this is hopefully something that you will that you will see in my performance if you if you watch the the video after after our discussion. Um, it's a very emotionally intense experience for me to perform this. Um, uh, it's it's very noisy. It really feels like screaming most of the time, and I <laughs> um, so it's. Uh, it uh, it feels like a very a, a strong release of energy in which I I do feel physically connected into the machine, quite em embodying the power, the physical power of the machine. And I think um, I really allowed the machines themselves to drive my process. So I, I didn't go into the studio at the beginning with some kind of preconceived idea of what I wanted this work to sound like. Um, I really like started off just by exploring what sounds the machines would make for me and the the electromagnetic microphone that i was speaking about has a lot to do with the sort of sound that is produced um but it, it just for me it's such a it's such a, a physically and, and disruptive sound that this really just like it rips through my body um and so it's something that i that i engage with quite physically and and become i, I do become quite connected into the machine um, and I, I like to get quite physically close to it. I had a couple of close accidents in the in the studio, getting my hair stuck in the sewing machine. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I would say emotionally, it's it's it's draining and intense. Um, and like I said, I do I I like to push myself to my limits so that I I feel the the the moment at which the body performs the glitch that the machine is also performing. The moment at which the machine and the body both kind of are at their at their um, wits end, if you will, or at that you're pushing them as hard as they'll go. Um, uh, something that I didn't really talk about so much in my presentation is that um, my my my whole investigation and my approach to this research is very driven by media archaeology, um, uh, which is kind of like a it's like a cross disciplinary, undisciplined discipline within humanities and media studies, looking at uh, kind of alternative histories of machines, but really trying to decenter the human um and look at uh kind of contemporary technologies through the lens of uh, obsolete uh technologies which might not be so well known and and kind of vice versa so it's a really new perspective on new media um and that i think was a really important part of my approach as well to allow to try to even though a lot of my research was very cultural studies kind of focused i did try to uh decenter the human in the studio um, and allow the implicit knowledge of these machines to uh, to drive my work and to um, inform my practice and um, to try to to try to just listen and work with what they were telling me if you will yeah uh, like about hair was it I will let someone else answer that <laughs> You can go ahead, Duke. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, I mean, there's the materiality of the technology and its accessibility, of course, in my work, but there's also uh, other non humans, which is the animals. So in this particular video, it doesn't exist, but in one of the screenshots from other videos, there's a cat. And the cat is interesting because the video is actually, again, the dubbing of a video of a Turkish gay icon having a moment on uh, Turkish daytime TV. So she's screaming at people who are distributing her uh, naked pictures from 1980s. And it's that whole performance of uh, hyper feminine anger, which has its own queer effect. And they are uh, uh, basically reiterating them synchronously alongside her while watching the video. That's what the video is. And the cat, by scratching them, is actually disrupting that whole performance and uh, like disrupting synchronicity there. So, what does it mean that uh, animals are? What, what happens when animals become in those performances of, if you like, some kind of um, virtuosity? How do they disrupt, and what does that disruption mean? 
So that is also something to uh, explore. I didn't think about it before. Thank you so much. Uh, while uh, Lot was presenting, I was I was like, like I was driving me crazy because there are so so many questions. <laughs> I was thinking like, it's a, I I was taking notes, but they are so confusing. I'm, I'm gonna try to organize this to to ask. Um, it's interesting how the human body itself is perceived as a machine to serve. To serve, uh, to be useful to capitalism. Uh, I was wondering here uh, how new technologies, such as communication technologies, which are so important, uh, maybe the core of today's technology, uh, how they are part of this process of engendering bodies. Yeah, and uh, thank you for that follow-up question because I also I like looking at, at, the, at the work of of, of, of um, three presenters. I was thinking, and I'm wondering, and if you can give us a little bit more of your own theoretical background in terms of this, like how I mean, technology exists either by the lens and microphone, right, uh, apparatus of cinema or in the case of Lottie, by the sound qualities of the machine. But then there is a process of reenacting this, reenactment through the repetition from the film, through uh, the voice, right? Through the dance and the performance. So I'm very fascinated how in these presentations, reenactment exists as a way of uh, embracing queerness. And, that's something that I would love to dive more because I'm actually very, uh, very interested in, in, in, in approaching queerness from sonic perspectives on the public space, right? Like how a, uh, how a queer space look like in terms of the soundscapes that allows or exist in there. So by looking at your work, I was so fascinated by the different ways of queering um, a subject in this case, you know, each of, of, of, of the films or in the work have an approach. But I wonder if you can share a little bit more of your theoretical background on that sense of performance and queerness or how performance can uh, embraces or achieves or bring us out of uh, this concept of queerness. I am trained in performance studies and these are actually some of the fundamental questions of the field, starting with Richard Schechner, obviously, and then there's Diana Taylor's work on the archive and the repertoire and how they are to an extent intersecting yet not exactly the same base for the transfer of cultural memory and the re-performances based on archives thing yeah, helps us, I think, think about that complicated relationship between the archive and the repertoire and the political potentials of the intersections uh, and how those are also gendered and sexualized often. So that's some of my... Uh, my... Course, uh, <laughs> I was just gonna say there's also the whole like, Amelia Jones, Rebecca Schneider line of thought on reenactments and reperformances, especially in contemporary art, but also in uh, like civil war reenactments, for instance. Please, Oti, I'm sorry. No problem. Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my background is in visual arts and fine art. So a lot of my theoretical background is kind of uh, art theory and art history. And my performance background, like my performance experience is actually relatively new and limited. Um, and I think in this way, I, I, the, the performative aspect of my work is, is, is extremely important in this case. It's not something that I 
did because I'm a performer. It's something I did because I feel this work required it. Um, and, uh, and, and I, but as I said, as I touched on in my, in my talk, I think it was really, it became about a kind of resampling, not only of the archive, but of the kinds of the performance of gender that we, that, that, that I see around me and that I experience in my everyday life. And, um, I felt like not only like this this process of resampling, which is you know like we talk about this in, in music, um, is uh, is something that I try to incorporate into my performance practice. So watching a lot of these videos of women using these machines of, of advertisements and demonstrations and the way that the body is positioned and uh, and viewed in relation to this machine, this is something that I tried to kind of. Um, splice together a, a, a whole range of different ways that this can be perceived uh, and, and performed. And it's something that I tried to sort of um, embody and reenact to these multitudes of, of gendered codes within one performance, within one kind of glitched identity, if you will. Um, I also, like I, I, I said, I'm, I'm doing my master's in sound studies in sonic arts. So this, uh, this field of auditory culture also has strongly informed this performance and I, I, I suppose that's partly why I've moved slowly into performance and and what could be called uh, music maybe <laughs> um, being in a being in a sound program uh, that's been very interesting for me I also have some experience some background as a as a more traditional musician playing more traditional instruments and it's, it's been re very interesting for me to come into sound studies with these two fields which I treated as completely separate my my musicianship and my visual arts background coming into sound studies and and approaching sound from a more conceptual background like a more conceptual uh perspective if you will the way i would use material in an installation or in a sculpture dealing with sound as this abstract material as something with um you know something with kind of metaphorical intention as opposed to something which is supposed to sound a certain way according you know according to certain rules which you know I've learned over years and years I really in this project I've just um I really I, I feel like I've been working with sound in quite a in quite a plastic way if you will may I <laughs> Okay, uh, I think more than communication, uh, my main background is cinema and film studies, I think. I've been studying cinema since um, 2009, maybe. And in my master's degree, I studied musical movies specifically. That's my main interest, I think. Musical movies from Hollywood, at first, and now from everyone, from everywhere, uh, especially looking for queer aspects in these movies. Uh, I started to study musical movies because of the genre itself, but it was interesting to see, to notice how queer they are, how queer they are, and there are many theories that inform this. And I like, um, it was fun because I, I've never studied queer studies before. And when I when I came across it, it was like, oh my God, queer studies are amazing. So I study more queer studies and queer aesthetics nowadays than musical movies themselves. It's it's interesting. I wanted to ask the three of you about the reception of, of your work, um, but I want to see if anyone in the audience wants to ask something before. Hi. Hi, Anna, welcome. I make you all the time. <laughs> Sorry, listening has been fascinating. Um, I was, it's just a comment more than a question, actually. Um, uh, we were talking in, in the other panels about how to listen with other ears, right? And for me, this has been really, really fascinating to know what is happening, how you are listening, actually, or, you know, or looking to other eyes, right? In, in different arts, like uh, the cinema or, or looking back through history, right? 
thank you so much for, for the presentation. Obviously, I, I feel a little bit more connected with the uh, Lottie uh, presentation because I'm working with nuns. And it reminds me, it, it was, oh my God, it's so touching because my grandma, I remember, I have these memories from my family and from my grandma uh, in the sewing machine, right? And I was just listening. And now I, I'm thinking about how how that had an impact, and I didn't notice until right now, like this very moment, right? And so it, it's been like, oh my gosh, it, it, it's there. And that's why I'm so um, attached to the dissonance and to these uh, other, other sonic aspects and how um, the technologies are always there so many ways, right? And they're always probably uh, looking to these new technologies and trying to, to achieve um, and progress through them. But uh, these things that they are present in your projects about looking back, uh, reconfigurate this, this new, um, this old technologies of this uh, say that but anyway the, the fact is that thank you so much it's, it's been really really really good and really uh, I was I'm, I'm also excited to listen to, to your work in the case of Lodi uh, well or look at it and reading your articles and other works thank you Thank you so much. That's amazing to hear. And yeah, very interesting to hear about as, as you know, as a noise musician, as you said, this early experience with noise through your grandmother's sewing machine. I mean, that's, that's incredible. That's such a great, uh, a great story to partner with my, to, with my work. So, and yeah, I'd be very interested to hear your work too. If you have any, any links, pop them in the chat. I'd be very interested to hear. Thank you so much. Um, I'll wait to see if uh, anyone else wants to do a question, but I just wanted to remind you that we're sharing the, the Google file uh, that where you all put your bios in. I think Freya sent the link and uh, many of the panelists from all the other sessions are sharing uh, links or articles or resources. And so that's still private among all of the people in our session. So if you wanna share things, uh, you know, your emails are there. And so uh, we're hoping this could be uh, part of uh, a bit of network creating and, and you guys can continue to have a conversation. Uh, we all can continue to have conversations, right? And, and, and just because um, Loti and Anna could connect and Anna and Ertug and everyone, so. That's great, thank you so much, I'll definitely do that. I just put the link in the chat box, so please feel free to add anything to that. That's our shared resource there. Sure. I mean, one thing that I can already say is that um, there was a, a time limit on the on the performance video that I was able to to show here at the at the conference, and so it's a, a slightly it's a half the length and a kind of earlier version of the performance than what I would consider to be the kind of more up to date. Uh, more developed, longer version. So I can also post a link uh, in the Google Docs for anyone who's interested. There's a kind of 20 minute version, which is, you know, eight months more recent than the one you'll see um, you'll see today. So it's, it, it's an ongoing developing project. Um, so yeah, if anyone's interested in seeing how the project is developing, then I can put a link in the Google Doc. Okay, uh, most of my works are in Portuguese, but I'll try to share some of them. And I, I'd like to reinforce how happy I am to be here today, because it's really a heterotopia for me. <laughs> because it's a cold day outside and many people are dying in Brazil. And Bolsonaro is president. <laughs> And it's so good to share experiences and queer experiences and sensations in such a place like this. Thank you so much for this. And I'm so sorry about my English. It was a little bit slippery, but it always happens when I need to, to look serious. <laughs> I'm so sorry.
No, you do no need to apologize. You Your English is job. great. To be honest, I was fully expecting you to do your presentation in Portuguese because your abstract was in Portuguese. So I was ready to understand nothing at all. I'm really glad I could hear your presentation. And your English is great. Yeah, all your presentations were amazing and we're so um, um, thankful for you to, we can all speak one, one language together, even though it might not be our mother tongue or our preferred language, but uh, it's just a tool to communicate. Um, so um, thanks for, for putting the effort, everyone. Um, and just in regards to what Luis was mentioning, I was very curious, I think I know we're almost running out of time, but I wanted to hear about the reception of the work um, that Ertuk presented in Turkey, because I, I know it's subversive. I know that the work that Luis Fernando presented is also subversive in the context of Brazil. And I think Lotti's work is also subversive. And I'm, I'm thinking about the quote you mentioned about how the sewing machine design was changed because it was subversive in its time and how we, did, we don't know it, right? And now it's a, it's a mechanism of control, right? The, the, the uh, controlling um, sexual fears about uh, women's sexuality, right? So um, I don't know if you wanna talk about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, reception, it's, it's kind of difficult to talk about uh, the reception of my work because uh, partly because I haven't really been able to perform it live very much because of COVID. Um, I was planning to do like the first performance was uh, due planned for March 20th, 2020. So that was exactly the wrong timing. And uh, then I got to perform it for a very small audience of 10 people a couple of times in October. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to say exactly how the experience would be with like a larger audience. Um, what, what interested me is that I, I think for in the, in the making of the work, I was very caught up in the, in the, in the research, I guess. Um, and what I didn't expect is maybe like what, what Anna was talking about. There's this whole kind of noise community out there who were like, oh, wow, this is, this is noise music. And I was like, oh, music. Yeah. I hadn't really thought of it as music before. Um, <laughs> so that's been a really interesting thing as well. When you're, when your audience can just give you this whole new perspective on, on what you're doing. Um, yeah, in terms of the, the the subversiveness of some of these technologies in their time, I find that that really fascinating. And I think it's something that I wanted to kind of imbue these technologies with, again, in the performance, through the performance, because um, possibly because of the fact that these machines are have been feminized in history, um, they get, they become domesticated, don't they? Like they become associated with docile women. Uh, you know, the sewing machine seems to be such a kind of, um, uh, unthreatening machine, if you will, because of this gendered association, perhaps. Um, although it's it's it's violent, you know, and it's very complicated. It's a very complicated machine, very complicated mechanism. Um, it's quite a quite an amazing thing, <laughs> um, and I wanted to kind of uh, re-imbue some of this excitement and interest and subversiveness in the machine through the performance um, as well. I can go. <laughs> Thank you so much for this great question. So I have an anecdote actually. So uh, at my dissertation defense, one of my questions to the uh, uh, to my advisors was actually about the last chapter of my dissertation, which was about Kemalist BDSM practices, and it opened with an autopornographic vignette. So my question was, should I keep it or should I save it for the book? What should I do with this? And the only Turkish person there said, by that point, you managed to offend everyone that you possibly can. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> so on one hand, like it's not desirable work in terms of my uh, relationships with the government. And actually, because this is the kind of work I do, I am not able to apply for certain kind of government sponsored prizes, although technically I should be kind of automatically getting them. So there's this like 
financial and professional problems that I am experiencing. And on the other hand, it is not desirable in the eyes of the liberal left that has been occupying the intellectual hegemony in Turkey, especially since the military coup of 1980. So this is a version of the left that is characterized by an investment in identity politics and definitely not interested in the redistribution of resources. So what happens in the end is that I have to negotiate everything through like EU resources. And that is one thing the neoliberal system is doing in favor of people like me who are coming from working class backgrounds, who do not have the necessary networks for survival in the academia and who are producing apparently disturbing work for all parties in, in the eyes of all parties involved. So I think uh, I, I'm just telling this also because like the neoliberal system also has certain promises and advantages because it, when you won the lottery, you actually get access to resources that you could not otherwise imagine of. And then you can use those resources to train people like yourself. And I am still looking forward to hiring the token cisgender heterosexual man to our research group, which is finally going to happen in August. Otherwise, we are all like queer people and young women and really enjoying ourselves. So these are also, I, I just want to use this opportunity to think about the broader systems that we are working in and the tensions, the political tensions that are actually defining them. Thank you so much. <laughs> As a person from the working class, I totally understand <laughs> everything. Yeah, it's so difficult to research here in Brazil being a worker. <laughs> um, Personally, I'm really happy with this reception because it's, I think it's so important to speak about queerness in such a moment here in Brazil specifically. Not only Brazil, but <laughs> whatever. Uh, and I'm so happy to reveal my work because I wrote this like two years ago. And when I reread this, it was like, oh my God, it's so interesting how it, it still works, how it's how how it's still alive, and how and how it provokes me. And I don't, I, I don't know. I'm so thrilled to talk about about this paper, to talk about queerness, to talk about her heterotopias here, and to listen to you and to your work. Your papers were excellent. Really, they really were really good and i want to to read to read and listen more of you well i thought you were all amazing and i hope we can continue conversations in this google doc and maybe who knows what might come out of that we're kind of nearing the end of our time. Um, I just want to suggest if anyone has anything last they want to say before we close this down, now is the time. <laughs> well then, Maybe now is the time to, to end on that good note. And um, all the best to everyone. This has been so interesting. And I really hope we can all um, keep each other posted and, and follow each other's research. Yes, thank you so much to you and all the organizers, to both the presenters. Um, this has been an amazing conversation. And uh, yeah, I feel very honored to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was really one of the best panels I've ever participated in, <laughs> in especially in terms of the conversation and fellow, the work of fellow presenters as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Etuk. Thanks for participating. Oh, sorry. I just wanted no, no, no. to remind you to 
everyone to connect to see Loti's performance. I think it's uh, starting in uh, at noon here, right? But uh, but not sure. Uh, what time zone. Yeah, in in on the hour, in four minutes, I think. In four minutes. Um, Okay. In four minutes. Well, um, I don't have the link at hand, but I'm sure I'll find it in my email somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.